as our world races at an ever faster pace. We'll land an airplane every 70 seconds for more than two hours. And delivery deadlines shrink. Being an island, there's a lot of medicine coming in. It's always urgent. The skies aren't necessarily the limit for the mega movers. Almost everything in this world you can put in this aircraft. In this series, we go deep inside the $6 trillion air freight industry. Every day, we move the equivalent of 3% of the world's GDP. You name it, we can move it. Showing the people. You have a lot of high anxiety, you don't want to do this. They're just sitting on the runway laughing at me. And incredible operations. It's a little yeah. bit sticky. Whoa, 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 whoa. We have an aircraft on stand 666, which has got an engine for it. You get two minutes to get there. To keep this complex, high-pressure trade airborne. There's 30 tonne of weight on that aircraft. It could tip the aircraft up at worst, or it could damage the fuselage. And travel with an extraordinary array of goods. Now we just need the spacecraft so we can load and then get out of Dodge from out-of-this-world giants. Life-saving medical supplies. It's a very good feeling knowing that every day we are shipping medication that could improve someone's life. Perishables. Nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. And components for some of the greatest spectacles on Earth. 21 races, if it took three weeks to get it there by sea, we need a 63-week year. Uh, we have to use that. Put your seats in the upright position, buckle in, and prepare to go max speed with Mega Air. In this episode, the world's biggest package handling facility goes into overdrive. This is our view of our bags being sorted. Pretty incredible place. It's huge sorting and delivering around two million items a night. It's just the definition of a mega air operation. We hitch a ride on the early morning mail flight. We are under time pressures to go down to the Channel Islands. You've got the loaders there and the lorries waiting to take the freight on to the customers. Delivering vital supplies to the remote Channel Islands. Being an island, there's a lot of medicine coming in, and obviously this is priority. It's always urgent. A mystery air cargo has crew scratching their heads. Shall we have a quick look and see if we can see anything? At what's inside the box. We have to be extra careful. We don't want to drop this. Here we go. And an aircraft fire crew bravely enters the inferno. There's a lot of dangers that we need to be aware of, and we get two minutes to get there. As they tackle a full freighter blaze. External fires on the number one engine and on the wing. Louisville, Kentucky, the home of fried chicken and the world's largest automated package handling facility. The Going by the grandiose title Worldport, UPS's most mega facility can process up to four million items a day something Jim still struggles to get his head around. Every time I come out to Worldport, uh, I'm still amazed after 15 years here. Every day we move the equivalent of 3% of the world's GDP. That's more than 20 million deliveries every single day. I enjoy driving around the airport. You have to have your head on a swivel while you're out here because there is a lot going on. I mean, you can see right in front of us, we have aircraft that'll be taxiing uh, down the ramps. And the one thing you have to remember is that airplanes always have the right of way. And so every time a vehicle on the ramp either goes forward or backs up, we honk. So we honk once to go forward and twice to go backwards. This is a place where size really does matter. Worldport's mega 5.2 million square feet hub, equivalent to 90 US football fields, caters for around 300 flights daily. That's an awful lot of packages to process. This operation is mind-boggling. To get two million packages a day sorted, we need just a gargantuan facility. Uh, we've moved things like whale sharks, 
Uh, it might be a critical medical shipment. It might be an e-commerce purchase, something you bought online. We can move just about anything, just about anywhere. A boast even more impressive when you consider most of this takes place while we're all in the land of Nod. So we're wrapping up our second day of operation during the day. It'll get quiet for a while, then the joint really starts jumping about midnight. And then we'll land an airplane every 70 seconds for more than two hours, getting all that volume on the ground so we can get it in the building, get it sorted, and get it back out and delivered on time the next morning. So as the sun dips below the horizon, there's a real buzz in the air, not just from squadrons of aircraft, but also the nervous anticipation of an impending package tsunami. What's up, Bill? It's something that's all too familiar for the aptly named Chase, who faces nightly pursuits against delivery deadlines. It is very busy on the night side. It's kind of the start to the hustle and bustle. They've been on nights 11 years now. My wife does not like it that I work nights, but I do prefer nights over day sort. I got a good solid eight hours of sleep and ate a nice healthy dinner before I came in here, so I'm ready to go. Chase's first world port of call is one of five wings, the docking arms for the avalanche of arriving aircraft. Right now, we're headed into our, uh, our wing, our wing echo. You take your badge, badge into the badge reader. What that does is essentially clocks you in for the start of the sort. Come on with me and we'll walk into the inbound operation. What up? How you doing? What's up, dude? What's up, man? Hey, we got everybody ready for this? Yep, we're all set People up. in place? Yep, ready all to right. go, ready to go. You want the aircraft to be offloaded uh, as quickly as possible, and once they're inside, the inbound operation can start unloading those containers. So it's, it's a very fast-paced and uh, time-sensitive job. Here's the actual inbound aircraft right now coming down the runway. It's gonna make the turn, it's gonna actually park and block, and once it gets blocked in and we get the green light, we're gonna start the offload process. How long is it gonna take you to get this offloaded? Uh, I have it done in about 15 minutes tops. 15 minutes. Probably closer to 10, but 15 tops. Yeah. I have it all in. It's approaching midnight and it's crunch time. Literally, as hundreds of package containers crunch down on special rolling dogs. A person's up there using a joystick and controls to get the containers onto the K loader. They then lower it and then the employees will then pull it from the K-loader onto the dock where they use the roller system to get it into the inbound so that way we can start the unload process. Excuse me, slide it out of the way here. Nice. Look down here, these rollers that are on the floor, these casters are designed to help shift containers easily. So like for instance, this AMJ right here, after it's fully loaded and can weigh anywhere between 5,000 and 6,000 pounds. It would probably take 10 people if they didn't have the casters. I don't know if I could move 5,000 pounds, but there might be somebody out there. This is now do or die for tonight's million plus package sorting onslaught. We are flowing 140,000 packages through. Hundreds of thousands of components must work perfectly to process these items and keep to Worldport's average sort time of just 13 minutes. Helping people get what they want, it makes me happy. I feel like one of Sandra's helpers. <laughs> it's 3.45 a.m. at East Midlands Airport, UK. While the country sleeps, Captain Nick Winter is preparing to become a real high flyer among Britain's postmen. Today we're going down to the Channel Islands. We're going to Jersey first and then Guernsey. We take up to about eight tonnes of mail and freight down to the Channel Islands. And as you can see, we start early so we can actually get down there. People are getting up in the Channel Islands and they want their uh, papers, their mail and their deliveries. And it's all delivered before nine o'clock. Yes, Nick helps provide the isolated Channel Islands with a crucial link to the outside world. His delivery weapon of choice is a British Aerospace ATP-F twin prop plane, a freighter known for its short haul efficiency. So we just have a check round, making sure there's no leaks, really hydraulic leaks or oil you can see on the floor or the tyres, make sure there's no splits and cuts. 
that the brakes are okay, general wear and tear you can see, and any signs of obvious damage really. But as you'll see on the flight, you get great views and uh, it's not a bad office in the sky, in fact. While Nick scrutinizes his plane. This is just the hydraulics there, we're just making sure the levels are correct. First Officer James Cadman oversees the load of around three tons of freight, containing everything from urgent financial documents to medical vaccines. We're using a belt loader over here. Uh, one guy at the bottom is putting the boxes on and parcels. They've been brought to the top. Our guy here, then it's taking them down to the middle bay and loading them from there. We'll then fasten the nets around it to uh, ensure it's each bay, and that also helps load balance the aircraft by categorizing each bay in different weights. This is an extra like, flight bag. If the aircraft wasn't in balance, it could effectively cause a crash on the aircraft. So it's very important to make sure that the aircraft is balanced at all points in flight. This is the last one. Yeah, this should all be. It, it should be the lot, yeah. OK, that's good. We're very conscious about time, making sure we don't have delays. With the last package on board, it's time for liftoff. But first, their thoroughbred flying machine needs free rein. These are prop straps. Basically, what they do is ensure the props don't move in high winds, hit anyone in the head or anything like that, really. Safety is king. Then... It's up, up and away. The first leg of this mega postal run is a 250-mile blast to Jersey. Then, after a short 24-mile hop to Guernsey, back home. M6 is backing up as per usual. Yep. The dawn is breaking. We are under uh, time pressures to go down to the Channel Islands. It affects a knock-on effect if you're late onto the other two islands as well. And then, of course, you've got the loaders there and the lorries waiting to take the freight onto the customers and to the shops. Their daily task, fly 520 miles and make two offloads in just over four hours. But for now, James's head is filled with more weighty matters. When we get to uh, Jersey, we're going to lose certain amounts of load off the aircraft. So we'll probably lose bay one, two and three, leaving Guernsey with bay four and seven. We're going to Jersey first, which is straight ahead. The islands do suffer from fog. Uh, quite often we'll come down and we'll have to hold. Um, if it's foggy, sometimes we can't get in and we have to go all the way back to East Midlands. Later, we'll find out whether the Channel Islands weather gods are in benevolent mood. Or if not, the islanders will be left stranded, empty-handed. There's some cloud cover down there, isn't there? As we've seen, East Midlands Airport is one of Britain's busiest hubs for air cargo. This multi-billion vital artery to UK trade must be protected at all costs. And part of that huge responsibility falls on the resident fire rescue crew. On a daily basis, we're kind of prepped for anything, effectively. It could be a passenger aircraft or indeed a freight aircraft. Each have their own inherent dangers. The cargo side of operations, there's a lot more vehicular issues we'll have in relation to access because the aircraft, if it's on stand, might be loading, unloading. It might have dangerous goods on it. It might have animals on it because we move animals through East Midlands Airport as well. So there's a lot of dangers that we need to be aware of en route and we get two minutes, not exceeding three, to get there. In order to meet this critical target, practice makes perfect. And tonight, the fire crew are on one of their regular training drills, using a dummy aircraft fuselage. take is just around the perimeter of the airfield. Um, obviously, we have to be mindful of all the other operations. One of the concerns we have when flying passengers see big rates of fire on the corner of the airfield, it doesn't always project a good impression. But obviously, we need to make sure that we're all competent within our roles and be able to operate during the day and the night.
So tonight, we've got a freight aircraft that has a single engine at the rear on the tail and two engines, one on each wing. We've got aircraft taxiing up now onto the uh, 27 end that are about to take off. We've got aircraft on the, on the Alpha taxiway. We've got uh, aircraft being loaded and unloaded, passengers, cargo. That's all happening as we stand here and we plan our exercise. This firefighting rig is a Frankenstein aircraft made from sections of the 737, 757 and 767 and fitted with industrial sized gas burners. So effectively I can control the on off of the main burner. Uh, the engine the pilots are lit. The guys, I can see are now just turning around at the, uh, the holding point. So as soon as they radio up, we can call them into an aircraft fire. Rescue three of a running call. We have an aircraft on stand 666, which has got an engine fire. I'm going to start up the fires. This first warm-up engine drill is all about containing the danger of a jet fuel fire that can burn at a metal melting 2,200 degrees Celsius. Wearing heavy duty proximity suits, Jez's crew must try to extinguish the blaze within minutes. So I'm looking at the monitor spray for the front of the aircraft and the snozzle which is positioned at the rear of the aircraft now will deploy. It's a slight, a slower process but this nozzle can get a lot closer than the other two. What's happening now is the lads have changed their uh, tactical to defence. The lads and lads have now stepped out of the, uh, the, in the risk area because the fire's been extinguished, but when they've done that is they've opened up their spray branches to afford them as much protection as possible, should there be a reignition. Engine fire dealt with. Later, after a minor hiccup... H, have you got the lighter? Yeah, it's a bit daft, isn't it? Fireman without a lighter. The heat is cranked up to the max with a full cargo inferno. Please respond to an aircraft. It has multiple fires. There are dangerous goods on board. In Louisville, USA, it's midnight and crunch time for the world's largest package sorting facility. We got everybody ready for this? Yep, we're all set People up. People in place? Yep, ready right. to go, ready to go. As thousands of containers, containing up to 400 packages each, are humped into the main sorting core, they're separated into three groups. Irregulars or oversized items, parcels, and smalls. You guessed it, small items. Hey, can you drop a D-bagger on 3 Delta, please? And don't be misled by their name. Smalls make the biggest slice of the sorting pie. Small sort is where a lot of volume runs through. We run anywhere from 54 to 60% of volume sometimes. So small sort's where it's at. <laughs> when I'm in this room, I'm always looking at the production to see how our volume is flowing. So we scan through the cameras and uh, look at where we're at on our flows. Our production numbers are really, really amazing. We are flowing. 140,000 packages through. Outside April's sanctuary, the rush is on. Worldport has set a fraught average sort time for packages inbound to outbound of just 13 minutes. This place is very big. Lots of equipment, lots of people. The first part of the humongous sorting process is debagging. Despite its college initiation connotations, debagging is removing the contents from mailbags into chutes. We feed the beast. We make sure that we're keeping our flow up so that we can send it to the bags. They can then load it and put it on the aircraft and go. It's all on who can get the most. <laughs> and perhaps young Wyatt here is taking that challenge too much to heart. His approach, a little too keen. Wyatt, he uh, loves the D-bag and he definitely, uh, he definitely, it's his favorite thing. Yeah, if he likes to be up here, I gotta make sure he's on track. It's like a beehive in here. We're the workers uh, helping people get their package. You know, when you come in, you see all this, you think you're 
yourself, am I ready for this? Working day in, day out among boxes and bags has led Wyatt to ponder on one of Worldport's imponderables. I've been asking myself this question, which is more important, the bags or the boxes? That's been on my mind for years. What's the answer? Bags. I love how heavy it is. The more stuff you get, the more you can pull it in. I feel like one of Sandra's helpers. <laughs> At the other end of Wyatt's chute, is where the rather creepily named inductors take over. All right, so here we are inducting. She is making sure the labels are placed up. We have cameras that read the label, the destination, the zip code, and then it sorts to the area it needs to go to. The sorting is done by a staggering 155 miles of conveyor belts. As packages travel nearly five miles per hour, Scanners read the destination barcodes and divert them to their correct destinations. Automated genius. The packages are being sorted and the trays tilt into the bag. We have hundreds of bag positions with several destinations. So this one right here looks like it's going to Texas. We uh, fill our bag up, put our label on, we take it off, and then we put it over here on this. This is called our return line. Once it's on the return line, it gets shifted out, and then they decide on which destination it's going to. This is our view of our bags being sorted and going to the areas that they are gonna be loaded into the aircraft. Pretty incredible place. It's huge. It sure is. But a short distance away, fingernails are being chewed nervously. All UPS flights worldwide are planned and uh, tracked out of this building here. Their main operations center must not only ensure Worldport runs smoothly, but keep thousands of global flights on track. It's an early season snowstorm that's indicated on radar here, so we're evaluating the impact of that. 16,000 feet over the English Channel. There's some cloud cover down there, isn't there? Yeah, a little bit, but I think it's too much. The East Midlands cargo plane dodges the threat of fog and touches down on the small island of Jersey. Their first leg of their round-robin delivery trip to the Channel Islands. We're here. Great. There are no toilets on this stripped-down freighter, so first thing Captain Nick and First Officer James do is dash off for a very welcome break. Taking over is a human chain of handlers up against a demanding deadline. Work together, try and do it as, as quick and safe as possible. Being an island, obviously we need all these parcels for, for various companies every day, and the services run uh, four days a week, so it's really important to have it. And it keeps us on the job as well. Because this aircraft brings uh, cargo to Jersey, and it goes to Guernsey with some cargo as well. So the guys are waiting over there, obviously. Being in the morning, all the customers are waiting. They want, they want the stuff as quick as possible. So when it comes here, we've got the pressure of turning it around quick so it goes to Guernsey and, and the they can get their stuff as well. Normally, we've got a limit of 20 minutes. Uh, that's the time given by the airline, but we sometimes we take more or less. Today? Today's going to be a bit quicker because the camera is rolling, so... <laughs> Um, it is time critical, it's always pressure <laughs> to be away on time. Now we finished up at the back, so now we have some more cargo at the front, we're just going to move the truck into the front. It's always, always on pressure. That's it for you. Lovely. Off you go, off you go. Noah here has swapped one island for another. Tropical Madeira in the Atlantic Ocean for northerly Jersey. It's just the need for a Jersey that makes him grumble. I've done it for 15 years now, and I, I, I kind of like doing it, especially when the weather's nice. In the winter, not so much, but that's one of the, the things of the job. We're making good progress, and it'll be another five, 10 minutes, we'll be done. There's a lot of medicine coming in, and obviously this is priority. As soon as it comes in, our customers are waiting to get it delivered, because it's got um, medicine for the hospital. It's always urgent. That's why it's essential to have the service on the island nearly every day. 
Precisely 19 minutes after the East Midlands plane came to its stand, Noah and his colleagues have completed the two tons offload. That's it, ready to go. Job done. All safe to go in the offloader, so ready to push. Right, thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yes. We're going to push in a minute. It's going to take off and fly to Guernsey. Now it's time for a cup of tea, and tomorrow is another day. So Noah can enjoy his cuppa, knowing he came through the frantic airmail run with flying colours. Now the pressure shifts to neighbouring Guernsey. Can they beat the 9am deadline with less than an hour to go? Right, now we'll have to forklift the pallets that's on the board. So they need to be turned round and back out again to the stand spread. Helsinki Airport, Finland. Over 150,000 tonnes of cargo shuttle their way through this key Scandinavian hub each year. But every now and again, it throws up the odd curveball. Uh, here we have a, quite an interesting bit of cargo, actually, something unusual, uh, which has arrived from Germany today and has to get to a gallery in New York. So what, what do we have here? This looks, this is an unusual shape. It is, I know. I'm trying to work out what this is. By day, Peter Seaman is a strategist, but these odd-shaped boxes are bringing out his inner sleuth. Yeah. Shall we have a quick look and see if we can see anything? Can't see very much here. Normal, you can't see anything. No. I mean, it's high value, obviously, I would yes. imagine. It's, it's one of a kind, and it's good that these guys are trusting us to carry something so fragile. Yeah. As I understand, because of its odd shape and dimensions, you'll take it down there, you'll leave it in the kind of the, the general cargo yes. area, yes. and then it'll be have a special place. People will know where to pick it yes. up. OK, perfect. Great. Great. And now we start the job. Well, Lowry here better take care. For all he knows, he could be carrying a Lowry, a million-pound painting by the famous 20th century English artist. So not the time to get into a pallet palaver. So the thing is that I was planning to put that pallet on that side, but it's not possible because it's a little bit unstable. We still have to figure that out. We have to be extra careful. We don't want to drop this. Air cargo gets compactly assembled into multi-item pallets for optimal storage in aircraft. But the best method is still open for debate. OK. We have to do, this, do it again, because our supervisor just came here. We have to do it. We have to put the smaller box over here, but we also want to keep it those boxes safe. So that's why we add this wood. So the weight goes all the way here and here. Here we go. Now we're gonna complete the Tetris game. Last one. Yes, the fly pallet, it's 100% done. Congratulations. After applying a rope netting to keep his precious pallet securely bound, Lowry sends it into Helsinki's high-tech elevated transport vehicle storage area. Tough job. <laughs> or in other words, it's the place where robots rule. No humans are allowed in this area. This is all automated. But yeah, it's very futuristic. People in the control center, they know where every single item is. And so they can program these cranes to then take one of the items to, and move them to the other side, ready for them going onto a plane. Once the clever crane channels our mystery art boxes out to its designated aircraft, on this occasion, a wide-bodied A330, it leaves Peter's care with him still none the wiser of what's inside. We've just finished the loading and they're just waiting for final 
checks and then push back from the gate. And uh, yeah, this flight takes off in, in, in 20 minutes. So this is headed to a gallery in New York. It's packed safely. And as far as I know, everything's gone really smoothly. So um, we'll have a happy uh, gallery owner in New York. The Anna's Arena Art Gallery in Manhattan, New York, has a growing reputation for showcasing art that challenges minds and perceptions. But more importantly, after a great deal of speculation, the time has finally come to reveal what's in the boxes. What a surprise. Oh dear, not what we were expecting at all. It just goes to show, when it comes to air cargo, it always has the ability to shock. In the dead of night at East Midlands, there's a stench of smouldering aircraft. I'm going to start up the fires. We have an aircraft which has got an engine fire. The airport fire crew are mid-training drill to ensure they're prime, ready to deal with any emergency at this vital UK air cargo hub. Just going to check the fires, see if they're still working. They, they lit, are they? Is it still lit? But as the team prepares for their second drill, this time a simulation of a full freighter inferno, there's one key ingredient missing. Fire. We just need a lighter to, uh, to start proceedings. Small seeds grow eight, eight no, what is it? Small acorns grow big trees. And the small lighters get big incidents. That's what we need it for. The pilot flame for the aircraft's internal gas burners to initiate the fire has gone out. You got the lighter? The things are out. H, have you got the lighter? You got the lighter? You got the lighter? Yeah, it's a bit daft, isn't it? Fireman without a lighter. Eventually, some bright spark comes up trumps. Oh, yeah, you got it, yeah. I'll bring it. Just light this one back up. And the giant gas flamethrowers can be ignited, ready for the big burn. On stand one, two, one. It has multiple fires. There are dangerous goods on board, and the pilot's decision is to evacuate both him and his two other personnel. I can confirm multiple fires. Depending on various factors, fires can spread from the exterior fuselage to the interior cabin in 90 seconds. Oh, there's bloody fire there. And with pretend aircraft crew on board, it's all about rapidly containing the blaze. So now you'll see the deployment slightly varies because we've got the monitors at the front that have to be very mindful of the vehicle at the back. OK, so I'm looking at the monitor spray. We're looking at the deployment of the snozzle. And the effectiveness and rapidness of where the guys are bringing out the sidelines, enabling them to deal with the undercarriage, underwing, and engine fires. An airport fire engine can pump out 5,650 gallons of water per minute and it takes three trucks to quell the flames. All the fires are now covered effectively. Station managers pass all those relevant messages. External fires on the number one engine and on the wing, now extinguished, Trevor. The guys are now setting up for breathing apparatus. From a training perspective, we're just set up to ensure that we're going to check the internal temperatures of the aircraft. We'll check for heat transfer, and there's uh, the report from the pilots with the dangerous goods, etc., to make sure everything's still intact. But most importantly, the aircraft is safe to enter. We have certain skill sets, as um, Liam Neeson would say, that we could use to assist in the stabilisation and the safety of the aircraft. Temperatures inside a charred cabin 
can top out at 810 degrees Celsius. Oh, losing you. While smoke inhalation and other deadly fumes can kill in seconds. Come on. After the crew gives the charred aircraft rig the all clear, another important fire drill is home and hosed. Thanks for your efforts, some really good exercises tonight. Uh, lots of good teamwork, that's what we're all here for. Thank you. Off. Hit the shower! The biggest things we need to bear in mind is that whilst we're undertaking this training, there is a reason, and we can't imagine and, and put in place every scenario, but the reality is we could get a call out, even now, to any job, uh, to any style, type, size of aircraft that operates out of East Midlands Airport. So there's a massive array of potential risks and hazards that we have to be educated in, and every other firefighter can make correct decisions on scene in a timely manner. And at the end of the day, who doesn't love running out of fire? The early morning air package and postal run is entering its critical final phase. Because this aircraft goes to Guernsey with some cargo as well, so the guys are waiting over there. They want the stuff as quick as possible. Having made a dawn flying delivery to the Channel Island Jersey, the plane touches down in neighbouring Guernsey with just 45 minutes to offload a ton of freight, ready for the start of the business day. Everyone knows their job, get on with it, and uh, away we go. It doesn't take us that long. It takes longer if it's all loose loaded, but today we had quite a few pallets, so it's a lot quicker. We'll get the forklift and I'll let it with forklift. Not raining for a change, so it's, it's all good. As you can see, we haven't got that many stands here, so we can't really accommodate for lots of planes being stuck on the ground. So they need to be turned around and back out again so the stand's free. By 9 a.m., the 2,615 cubic feet cargo hold is bare. All the Channel Islands urgent mail and packages have been delivered. It's all good. Fully offloaded, we're just going to take the chocks, the cones away, and then we get these boys started up and they'll be off on their way. The only bags left are under Captain Nick's eyes, courtesy of his 3 a.m. start. What we'll do is just go and check the aircraft. It all looks secure and just check the ballast is secure. You just need to balance it because it's very nose heavy, this aircraft. The ballast in here can either be sort of concrete blocks or it's containers full of water and it's all strapped down so it's nice and secure. We need to carry that so the aircraft can trim. We just about made it on time today. So we're just going to close up now and then we're, we're ready to go. There are certainly no frills on this island package holiday. And after personally stowing his aircraft stepladder, Captain Nick takes the controls and guides his twin prop into the great blue yonder. But he wouldn't have it any other way. If you tell people you're a pilot, they, they straight away think you're flying long haul for BA. That's all they think that pilots do. And they don't realise that people actually fly mail and cargo. Then they ask you, well, do you actually want to become a proper pilot, fly passengers, fly for a proper airline? But they don't realise that when you're sitting in the front, it's the same job. It doesn't matter what's in the back, whether it's freight or passengers. People think it's, it's a very glamorous life being a pilot, but uh, if they come and spend a few nights, they'd see the realities of the dark, the cold. What we do miss on our aircraft, of course, is the, uh, a toilet on off airframe DIC. Around four hours after their pre-dawn departure, and bladders sloshing like the 200 litres of ballast in the back, and Captain Nick and First Officer James return safely to home airport, East Midlands. Good morning, boys. How are we doing? Fine, are you? Yeah, not too bad. Pretty standard day, to be honest. We left on time and got back. Not pretty much on time, so can't really complain. It's a different job. It's not a nine-to-five job. It's quite varied and it's good for your flying skills because you're doing short sectors as well. And people are great that you fly with, so um, yeah, it's an interesting job. Uh, we've, we've done a good job today. We can go and have some breakfast now. <laughs> in the early hours of the morning in America, 
the Louisville residents are in deep slumber, oblivious to the frantic rush at Worldport as they sort the world's urgent package deliveries. Everything going good tonight so far? Yeah, we're good. good. Pulling the myriad levers of this vast, complex planetary enterprise is the UPS nerve center. We're only going in one main room. It's all open. What they call the Global Operations Center. This is the core where uh, all the activity happens. All UPS flights worldwide are planned and uh, tracked out of this building here. To do this job, you need to be an excellent problem solver, uh, as well as uh, ability to handle multiple issues at one time. Helping to weather this storm of logistical headaches are Worldport's resident meteorologists. I don't like doing this at 3 o'clock in the morning. This seamless, multi-billion dollar global operation depends on them accurately navigating UPS's fleet of over 250 aircraft past an oft tempestuous Mother Nature. We have uh, a lot of numerical models that I can look at. The tools I use to make my forecasts of uh, snow amounts or rain amounts or where the thunderstorm activity is going to be in, in the future. Now, what we're looking at here tonight is an early season snowstorm that's indicated on radar here. It's going to produce uh, one to three inches of snow for Des Moines, Omaha, and Kansas City. So we're evaluating that and the impact of that on the airline over the next 24 hours. So we have five meteorologists here. And if the meteorologists weren't here providing weather information for the planners, their planning process uh, would be deteriorated. It's this daily pressure to deliver that makes Worldport's five meteorological musketeers believe they're indeed a cut above. We trust each other. We do our own forecast and I don't pay much attention to what other people are saying. I don't listen to the TV guys. <laughs> Away from the relative calm of the high-tech global operations center, down on the shop floor, the place is buzzing. What's up, Sierra? As over one million packages are being processed. With an average 13-minute sort time per item, the pressure is at its greatest. Loaders must rapidly and efficiently pack cavernous cargo containers ready for the waiting planes. There's always a high sense of urgency. Every package is a customer. So you always want to get them from a cart, from a chute, into a container as soon as possible, so that way we can make sure that we get everything out on a nightly basis. But for the workers, it's not all work, work, work. A lot of people will, will play a game. So if they load a, a container like this every night, they try to up how many packages they can get in between this one and the next one. So if they fit 500 in this container, they'll try to get 600 in the next container. If you had to, comp if you had to compare what we do on a nightly basis, it's play Tetris of how much you can actually fit into one of these containers. Signs that I've checked everything and it's good. Put it in the pouch, hand her the seal so she can seal it up. Good to kick off. So within roughly 30 seconds of a container pushing back, a new container will be brought in to be loaded, and the same process will continue until it's time to pull the aircraft. It's a hustle, it's a bustle, it's a fast-paced job. There's a lot going on. You're dealing with a lot of people on a nightly basis, but it, it's fun, uh, and it's what you make it. The final stage of the relentless rush to deliver packages is the aircraft load. Doc 11's getting here at 150. Yeah. All right. So taking a look at this, our Doc 11 is the inbound Long Beach is actually arriving at 150. And that's where our old friend Charles Myers has to bring his A game. It's got a load time of 2.32 a.m. We're always under strict time constraints here. Minutes matter, seconds matter. So we want to do everything we can to get these planes out on time. Being Worldport, it's no surprise that even during this most manual task, humping container cans onto planes, technology still plays a part. I'll put the weights in right here. And when I, when I put the weight in, it'll, it'll, it'll turn blue that it's good. And when it goes in, in position up there, they also have, a, have one of these up there where they scan the can. And once that can is in position scanned, it'll turn green on, my, on mine. It lets me know that we're good, that that can's in the right spot. Once the last can, 
is in the can, the first of hundreds of fully loaded planes takes to the skies. Part of the never-ending round-the-clock race to deliver packages to you and me. Roughly tonight we'll process uh, 1.2 million packages. It's just the definition of a mega air operation. Next time, there's more crazy cargo, more fabulous freighters, and more demanding deadlines to hit. As Mega Air cranks it up to the max.